What a moment. What a time to be alive. What a privilege we all have in Christ. I have, uh, have my sheep packed outside there. Are you ready to board? <laughs> Are you ready to board? Yes. You should be excited as I am every time I remember that uh, today is Sunday. You should be excited. Now, honestly speaking, the Lord is doing something in this local church. I, I have been teaching for decades. But this last five weeks of four weeks or so, five weeks or so, I can tell you as a teacher, I'm seeing things I have not seen just preparing and teaching. I'm convinced God is doing something. If after this, in other words, some of us, or if not all of us, we should be reliving our Christian life as we understand the elements regarding the church. Uh, apparently, we have been just worshiping God in ignorance. And that, that's typical of human. Uh, as your eyes get open and you get to know more about God and his plan, it helps you to relate to him. And so as we gather here to study his word, I want you to be excited about what God is doing, for he is doing something. Bow your heads with me, please. Father God, this is your time. Every time is your time. But this is a special time that you have set apart for the feeding on your word. For this is what the early church did. They devoted themselves to the teaching of the apostles. We have come here this morning to devote ourselves to the teaching of your word. Open our eyes that we may come to know you more. This is our prayer. In Christ's name, amen. Devotion to the Lord's Supper. Devotion to the Lord's Supper. That's the topic this morning. Devotion to the Lord's Supper. Acts chapter 2, verse 42c. Acts 2, 42c. We have, we have come to that third element. The question that's, that is still unsettled in my mind is why is the early church a force to reckon with? Why is the early church a force to reckon with? This, this church, wherever they went, very powerful indeed. Very powerful as a nucleus. Again, we have come to the third of the four essential ingredients of the, this old time religion. Old time religion church. The Lord's Supper, also known as communion, communion service or Eucharist, has been observed for 20 centuries. That would be 2,000 years since the time the Lord instituted it way back in Jerusalem. The institution is as important to the Lord as the Great Commission is. There are two mandates to the church that carry equal weight. The first one is the Great Commission and the other is the Lord's Supper. They carry equal weight. The first was given before the, before the cross. The Great Commission was given after the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Some scholars, now we, when we look at the Last Supper, which is the topic this morning, the Last Supper, some scholars question whether the phrase breaking of bread 
in Acts 2, verse 42, it see, it says they were continually devoting themselves to the, you go to the, to the third element, to the breaking of bread. And some scholars look at that passage, as you, we look at it this morning, they say, maybe, maybe that breaking of bread is just coming together and eat pizza and lasagna or eat uh, steaks and just have good time. You know how it is. When something is not clear, caught in the scripture, you see people just diving in to cut it anyhow they want. That's, that's, that's just the day we live in. But most believe that it refers to the Eucharist, the Lord's Supper. I believe that too for two reasons. You see, when you, when you look at it, it says that they devoted themselves to the breaking of bread. Well, anybody can just gather together. In fact, there are some areas in the Bible where they just came and broke bread. Anybody can do that. But I believe that it, is, it refers to the lost table for two reasons. The first reason why I believe that it refers to the lost table is because of that Greek word proskatereo, proskatereo, which we know to mean intense perseverance. Well, there is just no way if this particular uh, particular uh, observance that the early church did for this Greek word to command it. Well, well it's, it's like a, you, don't, you don't need to persevere to eat, do you? You don't need to devote yourself to eat, do you? Eating is natural. You don't have to put pressure to eat. They put pressure in the study of God's word. They put pressure in their fellowship. No doubt, they put pressure in that mandate the Lord gave them, the lost devil. Another reason the second reason why I believe is the phrase, that the phrase breaking of bread is, that is, refers to the lost table, is that the, that phrase, breaking of bread, is sandwiched in three other elements that were crucial in the church. One of the elements that were crucial in the church, as we have seen already, is devotion to the study of the Bible, the apostles' teaching, then we have devotion to fellowship. And you throw in another devotion here, breaking of bread. And then you throw in, you sandwich it with the last devotion, prayer. And that can be just eating ordinary. Special occasion for those four elements. As they gather together to observe, to fulfill the mandate of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was very important to them. They were told by the Lord himself to keep doing all this, keep doing this until I return. There are many questions that run through my mind as I endeavor to dissect this very important truth. You may have taken part in the communion service, but what does it mean to you? Even this morning, we partook of this element. Do you really understand its significance? Why is it important to the Lord? Of all the things the Lord could have told his disciples, why is this one so isolated and so important to him? To the point that he attached Not only urgency, but a continuous action. Why is it important to him? Why everybody knows that the Lord Himself died, or that He will die. They know that Jesus Christ, even after His death, they saw and they saw the proof that He died and was resurrected. But why must they gather all the time? to remember him just for these two elements, for all the 
throughout the time until he returns. He didn't tell them, do it, or do it just this time when you are getting settled. No, keep doing it until I return. In other words, pass it to generation, to generation, to generation, to generation, until I come back. Why must it be important to him? Have you asked that question? And, and, get, and get this. Why is it a source of divine discipline? Even to the point of removing a believer before his time. As we read this morning in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 30, for this reason, many of you are weak, many of you are sick, and a good number have already returned home. For what reason? Sporting to the communion service. Why? Has God attached such importance to these elements? Have you thought about that? You can see why I tell you that God has blessed you in a way that you don't even understand by bringing you to a place where he can present the truth to you. Myself, as I study the word of God, I chills run through my spine. As I begin to see things I have not seen before. They are there, but I haven't seen them before. We will have the answers to this and more questions as we examine the, the subject together. You may be surprised as I was. During my study, I took the pain to examine various commentaries. But to my greatest surprise, none of them spent more than two paragraphs on this very important topic. I was struck by their lack of devotion to it, I asked myself, could it be that they did not understand its vital connection to Christian life? It's very unfortunate. As for us, we will devote an entire lesson to answer the question as to why the early church made it a priority. Are you ready for that? You're, you're now bothered, aren't you? My ship will be here for a while. I think we'll be going back and forth. I probably will be needing a new captain. What is the meaning? Uh, what is the meaning of Eucharist? What does it mean? Well, listen, now we have begun to, uh, so that tomorrow when you partake or you hold a bread in the communion service, you will not be a novice. I can assure you that many Christians today are worshiping God in ignorance. You give them Elements, they just, mm, give me a cup. Mm. Like when I was in uh, Romania, one of my hosts, one of our hosts, he, he kind of shocked Tayo and I. We were seated, I think he came very hungry. He came to the communion, he didn't eat breakfast. Like I said, they, 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 as, as we are taking it, I think Tayo and I will still joke about it today this very day. And they were serving the, the he were, we, we sit there in the front and there was they, they, it was this long, long giant bread they brought. So it's not our, this small one we used this morning. A whole bread that they, I think they did what the Lord would say that they were doing. They, the Lord, they just broke it and broke it in pieces. Enough to just fill your hand when you grab it. And they passed pass it through and pass it through, pass it through, and the remaining, they put it on the table. And this guy, this fellow in front of us, after they get, he, he, got, he had this, after everybody took, he, he reached his hand and grabbed the big one, the, 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 the long one. And we, because we got, a, all, we, all we had was just small, small enough to, to, to put you, he, he brought the big one and started the, Eating. And uh, simultaneously, Tayo and I looked at him. He said, the Lord said, take and eat. <laughs> he did not say, take and taste. <laughs> take and eat. <laughs> you know, in other words, what we all are doing is you are tasting it. He didn't say, take and eat. <laughs> 
because he was hungry. <laughs> what is the meaning of Eucharist? Eucharist means to show a favor, to show a favor, to be thankful, or to give thanks. So we have many things to be thankful for when we take part in the Lord's Supper. We are thankful for our so great salvation. We are thankful for the Lord's immense sacrifice. We are thankful for God's many facets of his grace toward us. That's just in that one word. Eucharist. Or Eucharist. So what Jesus is trying to let you know is when you handle, when you, when you, when that piece of element is in your hand, let your heart be full of thanksgiving. Without him, your hope will be dashed forever. When you sit in a place where this observance takes place, be consumed with gratitude for your so great salvation. Be consumed for gratitude for the facets of God's grace from all vantage points. God has been so great, so good to us. That's just one meaning. That's just a meaning in a word. So we begin the weaving process of the fabric of this magnificent study of the Lord's Supper or Eucharist. So let's start with the first trade. We're going to weave a tapestry of this work. Let's start with the first trade. You got the first trade in your hand? You got, your, you got the first trade? Are you ready to, to weave with me? We're going, to, we're going to learn sewing. The first trade is the origin of the Lord's Supper. The origin of the Lord's Supper. In order to have a grasp on this institution, we need to join our lost disciples at the first Lord's Supper. So I think we just arrived. We just arrived. Our ship has just docked. Let's get out and join them. Let's join the lost supper with his disciples. Are you there now? Get settled. As you settle, turn to Luke 22, 19, and 20. Luke 22, verses 19 and 20. In other words, what I'm trying to do this morning is to take us back. Let's go back 2,000 years and be in the midst, pretend to be in the midst of our Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to stay there for a while because this teaching, as I present this truth to you, take your mind back 2,000 years. So we are there right now, seated, pretend to be looking at the face of this very one who will soon go to the cross. Luke 22, verse 19 says, he took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Eucharistia, oh, see it? Give thanks. What did we say the mean? Eucharistia mean? Give thanks. And that's it right there. He gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and gave it to the disciples, saying, this is my body which is given for you. Do this to remember me. After supper, he, looked, he took another cup of wine and said, this cup is the new covenant between God and his people. I'm reading from a New Living Translation. An agreement confirmed with my blood, which is poured out as a sacrifice for you. In a snapshot, the Lord's Supper is a meal of remembrance, of his suffering, of thanksgiving, and celebration of his death and resurrection. It's, it's, when you talk about the, the Lord's Supper, it is a meal in remembrance of his suffering, 
of thanksgiving and celebration of his death and resurrection. Because without that death and resurrection, we wouldn't have any hope. So the Lord said, do this to remember me. Do this to remember me. Or as the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians, chapter 11, verse 25, do this as often in remembrance of me. As often. Keep on doing it. It was taken after the Passover meal. The Lord's Supper was taken after the Passover meal. Remember when we read in the Bible, it says after supper. Have you ever asked what supper? Did they just finish eating? After supper. Let's turn back to Luke 22 verse 8. See, we are, we are connecting. We want, we want to make sure we know what we're doing. Luke 22 verse 8. The same chapter of Luke, if you haven't closed it. Verse 8. Jesus sent Peter and John ahead and said, Go and prepare the Passover meal so we can eat it together. Go and prepare the Passover meal so we can eat it together. This is like a domino effect. You answer one question, it touches another. We just answered, what is the Lord's Supper? Isn't what we just answered? All of a sudden, we see another supper. We take up another trade. You got your trade in your hand? And what's that trade? That trade is, what is Passover? What is Passover? How many of us here know what Passover means? What is Passover? What is Passover? Passover was a meal of remembrance in which the angel of death spared the life of Israel's firstborn. Firstborn sons and all the animals while killing every firstborn sons and animals of the Egyptians. It's a feast of remembrance, Passover. It's a feast of remembrance. When God entered into Egypt through the angel of death, whereby he knocked off killed everything that lives that was first born in Egypt. And none, he didn't touch any of the Israelites. This was the last plague that God performed and thus saved the people, his people, Israel, from bondage. That was the last thing. We, we have heard or you, we read of the Plagues that God demonstrated through Moses one after another, one after another, one after another. But this one was the last one. And when he did it, that was it. Salvation has come. And there was, turn with me to Exodus chapter 12. Exodus chapter 12. There we will take a, a picture of the Institution of this Passover. Exodus 12, in verse 3, we read, Tell the whole congregation of Israel. I'm reading from Berean Standard Bible. Some of, sometimes I just pick up a, a Bible that uh, I believe have perhaps a better translation or a translation that is, is readable. Tell the whole congregation of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, each man must select a lamb for his family. One per household. One per household. Not, not two per household. One. Your lamb shall be without blemish. A male, a year old. Verse 6. The whole assembly of Israel is to kill it at twilight. At twilight. Verse 7. 
Then they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lentil of the houses in which they eat it. Skip to verse 11. They shall eat the flesh that night, roasted on the fire with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. They shall eat it. In this manner you shall eat it, with your belt fastened, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. Verse 12. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, but both man and the beast. But the blood on your doorpost will serve as a sign, marking the houses where you are staying. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. This plague of death will not touch you when I strike the land of Egypt. Verse 14. This day shall be for you a memorial day, and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations as a statute forever. Now you got the idea of Passover, where it came from. It was from God delivering his people in Egypt, and he told them to keep doing this. So that you keep remembering what I did in Egypt and how you got out. So when any, next time when you hear Passover, remember that. Before we go any further, take up another trade with me. You got it? Let's make some important connections between Exodus 12 and 5. Now, I want us to make connections. Let's connect. Let's compare. Let's see what, remember the Old Testament is a shadow of the New Testament. The New Testament is the light of Old Testament. And so we, we, we hold on one hand the shadow and let's see the, what the light is. The light throws a room. So oh, now I see you. Before I didn't see you clearly. I, I saw your shadow. But now I see the whole picture. It's like those times when you take a, remember that time you take 24 millimeter Pictures, remember that, uh, what do you call it? Uh, that roll, roll, you take the roll, you take pictures, they are in the roll, and then you bring them out and you say, who is that? It looks like my uncle, but it doesn't look, he, who, it looks like an uncle, but it looks like, a, my uncle doesn't have that big head there. I don't think it's my uncle. But when you develop it, you say, oh, yeah, it's really my uncle. That's, you're looking at shadow. <laughs> so the Old Testament is shadow. And the New Testament is a developed picture. And so walk with me this morning as we do some connections. Let's make some con important connections between Exodus 12, 5 and 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19. And Exodus 12, 21 and 1 Corinthians 5, 7. We are going to make two connections. Both apostles, Peter and Paul, linked Christ to the Passover lamb. Both of them. Let's start with Moses and Peter. So I'm, I'm, we're going to see how Moses and Peter, how they work together to bring the picture to us. They spoke of the lamb as <clears throat> unblemished. They spoke of the lamb as unblemished. Turn to 1 Peter with me. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 and 19. 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19. We're going to see how they all tie together. 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19. Dear Peter tells us, you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your future way of life, inherited from your forefathers. But pay attention, especially to verse 19. But with precious blood, 
as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. Mark the phrase, as of lamb unblemished, as of lamb unblemished. As you have finished marking your, those of you, don't mark if you don't like marking your Bible. Mark it in your head. Go back. You just finished marking that. Go back to Exodus 12, verse 5, where we just read before. Dear Moses said, your lamb shall be an unblemished male. Your lamb shall be an unblemished male. Here in the Old Testament, Moses said, this lamb we are going to use for this Passover must be unblemished. And in, in, in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 19, Peter says, Jesus Christ, the unblemished lamb. You see the connection being made? We have just finished. Do you see the connection? Let me, do you see the connection? Do you see the connection between the lamb that was used for the Passover sacrifice in Egypt and the lamb of God? Do you see the connection? What do they have in common? What do they have in common? Unblemished. Unblemishedness. Now let's see how the Apostle Paul made his own connection. We just finished with Peter. Let's see Paul and Moses. Moses told the Israelites in Exodus 12 verse 21. While you are still in Exodus, just put your two fingers. Exodus 12, 21. 21b, the second part of 21. It says, go and take for yourselves lambs according to your families and slay the Passover lamb. Slay the Passover lamb. Now that lamb is now called Passover lamb in verse 21. Mark the phrase, slay the Passover lamb. Mark that phrase, highlight it if you want to, color it. The Passover lamb. And see what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7b. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7b. This is what Paul said. For Christ, our Passover lamb has been sacrificed. In the Old Testament, that lamb that they used was called the Passover lamb. In the New Testament, Paul calls Jesus Christ the Passover lamb. The Passover lamb has been sacrificed. Even the apostle John in the island of Patmos, as he was given a glimpse of the glory of the Passover lamb, and he saw multitudes, thousands, singing. Revelation chapter 5, verses 11 through 13. And there, John, in this island where he received the revelation from our Lord Jesus Christ. And this is what he said. Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne and the living creatures and the elders. And the number of them was my race, of my race, and thousands of thousands. Saying with a loud voice, they were singing. Worthy is the lamb that was slain. The lamb. Even John himself. Worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing to the one sitting on the throne and to the lamb. Blessing and honor and glory and might to the ages of the ages. Let the congregation say Amen. They were seated. They saw, John saw the glory 
of Jesus Christ being reflected in worship. He saw them. He saw thousands. This is future. As they gathered around the Lamb of God that was slain. Did you make the connection between the Old Testament Passover lamb in Egypt and the New Testament? Who is the Passover lamb in the New Testament? Jesus Christ. Are you afraid? Who is the lamb? Jesus. Jesus Christ. He is the lamb. The Old Testament was a type, a picture of the true lamb of God. Take a deep breath. I'm, I'm, I'm teaching, I'm teaching. I'm, I'm telling you, I'm teaching in a different way. Take a deep breath. Are you taking a deep breath? Close your eyes for a moment. Just close your eyes. We, we just arrived. Remember, we already with them. Now open them. See who is reclining at the table in the room with the 12 disciples and us. Remember, we are there. Remember, we took a trip. I just want you to, we are now, you have just opened your eyes. Look at the table. Who are you seeing? Who is reclining at that table? Are you sure? He is the Lamb of God, God's Son. Being prepared as a sacrificial lamb. I want this truth to sink deep. You may, be, you may be playing church, playing religion. Let it not be anymore. When truth hits you, if it doesn't change you, many questions should be asked for, thrown to you. It's Jesus, the Son of God, that is seated at the table. We just, we just put a picture of who he is. I have been able to explain to you from the Old Testament, the sacrifice that was performed there was a type pointing to the true Lamb of God. And you can see him sitting around this table at the Last Supper. The Son of God. Being prepared as a sacrificial lamb. He's not slain yet. He's being prepared as he sat on them. Remember, Moses told them to take a lamb. They will take the lamb and they will keep it in preparation for the time, the twilight. He didn't just tell, tell them, go take a lamp and cut the throat. No. He gave them the time they would do it. And Jesus was seated on that table waiting for that time. The next day, he will be sacrificed. The next day, he will be sacrificed. Now that you have made a connection, read Matthew with me. Matthew 26, verse 38. Matthew 26, Verse 38. Let's read it afresh. Matthew 26, verse 38. Let's, let's read it together. Open your Bible. Let's read it together. Matthew 26, verse 38. You find it? You find it? Okay, let's read it together. Then he said to them, my soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. That's what I need. My soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. It's like a, it's like a, it's like a lamp, like a sheep, a lamp, that is, will be used for this Passover lamb, for this Passover sacrifice. And it's tied up and put in one corner, waiting for twilight. And there, it's like assuming for a moment that that lamb has the idea of what will happen. I remember, for one, the, the animals have senses. Some, they, there's some way they have senses. They know that because they have the sense in, in, in terms of the sense they have is they know this is danger. God put danger in them so that they can run from when they see danger. 
I remember growing up back in, 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 in Africa. And during the time of Easter or Christmas, our mother would say, that, that, you see that chicken there? It's marked. That yellow one with a little black, black color, that's for the Christmas. We, they are all, they are, they are organic. Organic, you talk about organic? They, don't, they run around in the whole compound. And you see, your mother would say, okay, catch that one. Our team is ready. And once that chicken recognizes your plan, that chicken will fly. It will develop new wings. It will fly and we will fly with it. We will fly along. Because it has been marked for food. It's like that the chicken knows what is going to happen. And you can, you can, the chicken will run and run and run and run and run. And we run the chicken to death. And finally, rest it down. It may sometimes take an hour. Sometimes more than an hour. Running around. Running around. From here, he runs to here. We run after him. He, he jumps the fence. We jump the fence with it. He, everywhere. Because he knows that there is danger. That these people are not running after me for nothing. I will be the next meat on the table. I wish, another, I wish they can run after another one. <laughs> but I have been marked. Think what Jesus was thinking. Seated at that table. Thinking that tomorrow is that very day. The same one who said the hour has come. Father, the hour has come. In his prayer. Glorify, glorify thy son. That thy son may glorify you. The same one. He's now preoccupied with what will happen to him tomorrow. My soul is deeply grieved. Why did the Lord say that? He was preoccupied with the thought of being sacrificed the next day. He couldn't put his mind around the excruciating pain and the unparalleled agony of being separated from the Father. He just couldn't put that thought. It has never happened before. The thought overwhelmed him even to the point of death. Soon his body would be broken into pieces as the Lord's Supper's bread was. These are the things that were going on in his mind as he seated on that table. No wonder why he said, my soul is grieved to the point of death. Try wrapping your mind around the person of Jesus Christ who will soon be crushed first by those he created and then by the father himself. Who is he? Who is he? He is the son of God. The wonderful counselor. Mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. This is the one that will be crushed soon. The very one whom Isaiah recorded in Isaiah 6 1 as sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted. He is the very one whom Seraphim worshipped. And said, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Did you hear that? The whole world is full of his glory. We're talking about Jesus Christ. Whose glory are we talking about? Jesus Christ. His, the whole world is full of the glory of the one who came down. As a lamp. The prophet Isaiah beheld his glory and fainted. Isaiah saw the glory, he fainted. This is, he lamented in Isaiah chapter 6, verse 5, uh, reading from New Living Translation. I like the way they sometimes they, they put it in a simple English so you can understand. This is what they said. This is what Isaiah said it is all over. It is all over. I'm finished. I'm done. I have no, I'm, I'm, I'm finished. 
just by seeing this glory, this is, I am finished. It's all over. I am doomed, for I am a sinful man. I have filthy lips. I live among a people with filthy lips. Yet I have seen the king, the Lord of heaven's armies. The person he saw was Yahweh, Jesus Christ. The same one, the Apostle Paul praises in Colossians 1.16. In Colossians 1.16, Paul praises him. Paul said, for by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and by him. Now, picture him seated in the room as a sacrificial Passover lamp. Picture him. Have a good picture of him. Take a close look at him and let what you see speak to your heart. Let what you see of him or in him speak to your heart. Just take a picture. You see, what I did was to paint to you the glory of Jesus Christ. That's what I did to show you his magnificent glory before the time was formed. That same one whom Isaiah couldn't even look. That same one whom Seraphim sang holy, 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 holy. That same one was the one who came down and became a man and became a lamb to be sacrificed. Seated in that room is not an angel or any other creature. He's no other than the one whom the Apostle Paul say in 2 Corinthians 8 verse 9, for you know, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that though he was rich, yet for your sake, mind you, you are sick. He became poor so that you through his poverty might become rich. Jesus Christ exchanged his riches with poverty. He set aside his glory. He stepped out of his throne room and put on humanity. Why? Why? That he might be offered as a sacrificial lamb for your sins. That's why. So that in him, the internal death will pass over us. This is what the Lord wants you to remember every time you hold a piece of bread and a cup at the Lord's Supper. Every time at the Lord's Supper you are holding this element, let this thing run through you of who he was before the time was enacted. He wants you to remember that. That's what he says. Keep on doing this in remembrance of me. It doesn't just mean remember the name Jesus. No, he's, he, wants to, he wants you to remember his person. Who he was before the foundation of the world. It's one thing to come down and give us a special lamp for the offering. But it's one thing for him to come down and become that lamp. All other priests, they offered and killed lambs. No priest in the Old Testament killed himself. Only Jesus gave himself an, as a lamb. So he wants us to never at any given moment ever forget the cost of our so great salvation. It cost him everything. It cost him his riches, throne, glory, angelic worship. So he says, keep on doing this in remembrance of me. We take another important thread. And that thread is, what then is the significance of the Lord's Supper? What is the significance? What then is the significance of the Lord's Supper? There are five significant truths. There are five significant truths. One, it is a moment of a serious and intense reflection on our loss, on our life's journey from death to life.
It is a moment of a serious and an intense reflection on our life's journey from death to life. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. His blood has been applied to us and the internal death has forever passed us. Can we say praise God to that? The blood of Christ has been applied to us. And one thing, the internal death is passed forever. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. Because we are in Christ. And on the cross, his blood was shed. Death took place that we may live. Two, in remembrance of him, we reflect on the cost of our so great salvation. Keep on doing this. In remembrance of him, we reflect on the cost of our so great salvation. Three, three, in remembrance of his death, it brings to light the meaning of a sacrificial law. It brings to light the meaning of a sacrificial love. John 15, 13, greater love had no man than this, than he laid down his life for his friends. Four, in remembrance of his passion, the suffering Christ, we know God's unsurpassing love for us. In remembering of the suffering, the pain, the agony, the passion, his passion, we know God's unsurpassing love for us. That's the only way we can measure God's love. Somebody said, how, 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 do you, how much do you know that Jesus, like, that, that, uh, Jesus loves us? You, you know that uh, expression. Show me how much. See, how much do you know Jesus loves you? This much. Is that not big enough? In other words, that's a demonstration of my love by hanging on the cross and allowing my hands to be stretched. That's how much I love you. Not, not this much. Not I love you. Come, uh, come give me a hug. No. How, how can you hug this one? <laughs> that's how much he loves you. See, he, he, he's showing you he loves you. You are the one to hug him. He's not trying to hug you. He already given you a, a, a whole hand. Come, come close and hug him on the cross. That's how much he loves us. Four, again, in remembrance of his passion, we know God's unsurpassing love for us. Number five, in remembrance of him, we embrace the truth. We embrace the truth that our love for others must mirror Christ's love for us. Our love for others must mirror Christ's love for us. Now, let's look at the early church. Let's look at that old time religion. I'm with this truth. The early church expressed genuine and practical love for others. How could you not, as a believer in Christ, not express genuine love for others, having seen the example? They cared for each other. They took care of one another's needs. As they remembered him and his sacrificial love, they reciprocated in kind. This is what John the Apostle told us in 1 John 3 verse 16. 1 John 3 16, John tells us, this is how we have come to know love. He laid down his life for us. We should also lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. 
That is the picture of the early church. Listen, unless we imitate such life, we will continue to deceive ourselves as worshippers of God. And we, and we never go on to fulfill God's plan for our lives. I'll say that again. Unless we imitate such life, we will continue to deceive ourselves as worshippers of God. And we we'll never go on to fulfill God's plan for our lives. We just be church goers. Fill the benches every Sunday. We will never come to a point of glorifying God for our lives. We take up the last trade. Why is the Lord's Supper a source of divine discipline? Why is this last supper? Why, why is the Lord's Supper a, a a source of divine discipline to the point of death. Why? There are other things in the Bible, or other things in the Bible. Why did, it, why did God link one discipline, intensive discipline, dying discipline to that lost devil? There are two reasons. One, God wants to teach the church a lesson that the death of his son is never to be taken lightly. God wants to teach the church a lesson that the death of his son who left his glory, who abandoned worship, who set aside everything ought not to be taken lightly. That's why the discipline comes swiftly to let us know crushing his son on the cross was not an easy thing for him as God. And how dare you trample on their feet such sacrifice. Two, that living in sin and taking part in the Lord's, sup in the Lord's Supper are mutually exclusive. They don't go together. God is holy. He wants us to approach him in holiness. So in other words, God is saying to us, if you don't understand what I'm doing, watch me, watch this. That person is going to fall and die. Like Ananias and Sapphira, fall and die. This is not a joking business. This explains why we use 1 John 1.9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness before we take part in the communion. That's why we use 1 John 1 9, to make sure we are cleansed. Unconfessed sin at the Lord's Supper can bring divine discipline. That's why. We turn to 1 Corinthians 11, 27 as we bring this teaching to close. 1 Corinthians 11, 27 through 31, a place we read in our scripture reading this morning. Therefore, who eats, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But a man must examine himself. And in so doing, he is to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself, if he does not judge the body rightly. For this reason, many among you are weak and sick, and a number sleep. That means they died. But if we judged ourselves rightly, we would not be judged. This is grace on parallel. As the early church feasted their mind on Christ's unsurpassed sacrifice, how he gave up his comfort, how he gave up his throne, how he came down and mingled with those he created in order to save them. They thought 
was so much for them. It moved them to action. It moved them to serve the one who, who sacrificed they couldn't match. Christ's sacrificial love fueled them. His love fired them up. They were unstoppable. In this manner, listen, listen to me. When we understand the cost of our so great salvation, we too will be unstoppable in our worship of the Almighty. We will be unstoppable in our service of the great King. I close with Paul's prayer for the church. In Ephesians 1.18, Paul prayed to them, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of his calling what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the sense? With your head bowed and your eyes closed. We bring this teaching to anyone who is here without Christ, without hope. We want you to know that Jesus had you personally on his mind when he was hanging on the cross. Every sin that you have ever committed, past, present, and future, was judged on the cross. So wherever you are, the penalty was paid in full that you may have internal life. Internal life is a, a gift received by faith alone, in Christ alone. So where you are, like the thief on the cross who simply believed that Jesus was the Christ, instantly was moved from death into heaven. That can happen to you right now. If you will believe that Jesus Christ is the very son of God who took your place on the cross, who died on the cross of Calvary and paid for your sins, if you can believe that wholeheartedly that he paid for your sins in full, three days he was resurrected, ascended into heaven. That faith we give you internal hope. Father God, thank you so much for this time. Take your word and make it live to us in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.